Hello everybody, this is the second episode of Writing System Software. Today we will cover the argument of the Redis scripting uh, engine. Uh, as you may know already, Redis is, uh, can uh, accept Lua scripts uh, that can perform complex operations that, that, uh, with certain advantages from the point of view of the latency because uh, in the client you have to do the back and forth between the server and the client in order to carry on complex computations which is not needed, not needed if the, the business logic itself is sent to the server and also there are uh, efficiency concerns because uh, scripts are faster compared to executing the same commands from the client. However, the real um, the real topic today is the concept of simplicity. You know, many programmers will, will tell you that simplicity is very important. However, it is important to check in the real world what it uh, needs in order to reach simple code. Uh, the Redis scripting uh, uh, framework uh, implementation is basically a very successful example of extremely simple code in order to implement a very complex feature. Uh, you can check the source code here. So, uh, this is the Redis source code latest version. This is the scripting.c file that contains the implementation. And uh, this is a total of 2420 lines of code. However, if we check inside, uh, we will see that, okay, Lua scripting in Redis comes with a step debugger that has breakpoints, the ability to inspect and trace variables, everything you expect from a, a real debugger. And this debugger is part of the implementation. As you can see, it starts here at, um, uh, at offset uh, 1521. It means that basically 1000 line of code are just the debugger. This is all the debugger till the end of the file. So, the actual amount of code uh, that uh, Redis uses to implement, uh, to in implement everything about the core Lua scripting execution is actually 1,000 and a half uh, uh, lines of code in order to have everything. How it is possible? But be before to check that, let's step back and do some consideration about the design of this feature because many times the simplicity of the code is a result not just of an in designing a simple implementation but also it starts by in, uh, designing a, a simple feature itself in order to then have a, a simple code uh, simpler learning curve because the complexity is paid not just from the point of view of the code dimension but also from the point of view of the user that has to understand more code not the implementation itself but what the code uh, reflects in terms of complexity. Uh, first of all we use Lua as a scripting language uh, you know, Lua is not exactly my preferred scripting language. I like uh, other stuff like, for example, Ruby is my preferred language at that level of abstraction. Uh, however, uh, in order to write simple scripts, because Lua scripts are usually not like huge programs. You do some business logic inside the server, but most of the complexity is inside your application in the front end. Uh, every language is the same basically, unless it's COBOL or BASIC or whatever, totally broken. Any other language makes sense. It must be more or less algol-like, C-like, let's, let's call it C-like, so that uh, every programmer that 
we cannot uh, be sure about the background of the people that are going to write read these scripts. They can be C programmers, uh, they can be Ruby programmers, they can be whatever. Uh, Lua is reasonable. It has some weirdness, like starting indexes at one, maybe from a pedagogical point of view, maybe interesting, but everybody did this, this thing in a given way for like 50 years. So to change the history now, it's uh, just to put complexity actually instead of trying uh, simplifying things. But uh, also the not equal, it's uh, written not like that, but like that, or there are a few things like that, but well, otherwise it's a uh, good enough language. Uh, it's very simple, it has a more or less a, just a single complex data type uh, that's called the Lua table. And, uh, but uh, why it is, was a good idea to uh, pick Lua? Well, because of the implementation itself of the language. Uh, if you check the, the Lua implementation, it's a very simple set of NCC uh, source code and uh, it's small, it's extremely fast uh, even if you don't use uh, the just-in-time compiler that we don't use actually, we just use bare Lua uh, implementation in uh, NCC it's very fast, it's so fast that from the point of view of executing Redis scripts you pay basically the interface with Redis much more than the Lua executing itself. So often uh, Redis commands implemented, new commands, operations implemented in terms of Lua scripts are almost as fast as C coded uh, commands in, uh, in uh, Redis. So uh, Lua being simple, it means that we can ship it together with Redis without building complexities with great compatibility with the systems where Redis will be built. And also it means that Lua is a very a language that it's symbol to glue with uh, C languages. It uses an API that's very reliable, it works well. It's based on the idea of the stack. Uh, you see the stack as a glue between Lua and, and C, there is a stack. So this is a bit like not, not very not, it's not as simple as the uh, scripting languages that interface with C exporting like argv uh, argc and the context but it can be used after uh, a bit of practice so checking uh, uh, all the possibilities this looked like the best the second thing in order to make a simple implementation is to uh, in design uh, the Lua scripting not in terms of stored procedures uh, and before Redis basically uh, before, before Redis scripting every, everybody was doing uh, this feature like that that you define uh, a new command, for example, written in Lua or whatever, or in a, in a stored procedure format, and then you execute this uh, new stored procedure called it by name, for example. However, this creates complexities at different levels, especially you are not sure if a given server implements a given version of the stored, stored procedure. So, in turn, this adds a new complexity, like some versioning system, and so, 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 so forth. You start to basically go deep and deep and uh, produce more complex code and features. Instead, in Redis, things work like uh, in a different way. Let's start a Redis server and try some script. We just have a symbol interface that's called evil and we send the script uh, text directly to, to Redis, like redis.call, this is our main interface in order to call commands, it's increment uh, my counter, 
uh, you have to use like single quotes, otherwise it's going to conflict. Okay, I can see no reply from the command because I have to return some value. The returned value will be converted from the Lua type in the Redis protocol. Okay, usually doing very obvious things like numbers in Lua will be converted in the numerical type of the RESP protocol and so forth. And so that's it. Uh, however, if the script starts to be big, we are going to waste a lot of bandwidth. Uh, so what Redis is able to do is to tell the user one thing, if you, instead of sending me um, the script itself, you send me the SHA of the script, however, this will include a new line, so let's do the hashing without the new line, it will be the same for me. So I can write eval SHA, and I just give the SHA1, and everything will be the same. However, a given script may be not defined, for example, Let's modify here. So what happens is that the server replies no script, there is no matching script, so you have to use eval. Uh, this simple system makes for uh, the ability basically to run scripts, again instances that may be completely empty, and as a side effect of calling eval sha, then we will call eval with the body and the instance will be populated with the script in the scripting cache and so forth. Uh, another, another consideration uh, in the design of scripts is that keys must be explicit. Uh, here in this script I directly wrote uh, uh, nine, the name of, uh, of the key directly inside the script, but this is not the way to, to do it. The actual way to do it is to use the keys array and then I pass this zero here is the number of keys that are following and I say one key is following and the name is my counter. Okay, everything works the same. If you have additional arguments, uh, basically you pass them as arg v and so forth. So basically, uh, in the general form, it is eval, the body of the scripts, script, the number of keys, who bars up, and then any other argument we want to pass to the script. Why this is so important? Imagine, for example, that you have a fork of Redis uh, that persists some keys on disk. For example, if a key is very big and it's idle for a long time, we swap this key to disk. Redis not, doesn't really do that. There are all the branches that uh, implemented such feature. There is also a Redis Labs product that implements uh, ready some flash but uh, we have not such feature in the open source uh, uh, software because uh, at some point I decided to to focus just uh, in memory but imagine that you want to implement a fork like that or, or you use an old branch implementing this how do you know if uh, usually what what we want to do is basically to stop the execution of the command if the key is swapped on the, on the disk. So we stop the execution of the command, retrieve with another thread or something like that the key from the disk, and uh, at this point we pass the control back to the command that can be basically resumed and can continue the execution. However, imagine if the key name is inside the script, then we have like to try to execute the script stop in the middle of the script execution in order to retrieve the key. Basically, it becomes much more complex. So also this design of the explicit keys uh, in the 
uh, as arguments of the Ebal and Ebal Shah commands uh, are part of the simplicity of Redis scripting. Okay, so so now this is uh, just the, the, the same part. Now, now we want to to let's check the to, to look at the code to see how this is uh, so simple in uh, so, so small uh, amount of code and consider that inside the, inside these uh, 1000 of uh, lines of code there are tons of features like you have uh, ability to select different replication models you can replicate commands or you can replicate directly uh, evil or evil shot uh, you have protection of global bars. In scripts, you don't want uh, scripts to have like um, uh, the ability to set global variables. Otherwise, the script is no longer like a pure function, and you have side effects. And uh, uh, you consider that you have to replicate the script in the AOF file in the in the slaves and so forth. So we have that as well. Then we have the ability to have a scripting cache because uh, we want to remember what slaves had what uh, script already in memory uh, so that basically we, we can replicate some scripts as able SHA instead of using able all the time and save time, uh, same, same uh, save space in the replication link between the master and the slave. And there are other features like uh, um, ability to handle uh, infinite loops. Uh, Lua is modified in order to have a deterministic uh, pseudo-random number, number generator because it's very important that Lua scripts are pure functions, so there is this uh, this thing about trying to avoid side effects or in general things that are random uh, in many places of the Lua scripting engine. But the most important thing about about this is that basically uh, you want you want to avoid the following. Normally, how do you implement scripting? You start by creating bindings. Like every Redis command should be implemented like in Lua uh, with a function that binds the implementation of the command or at least the logical operation that the command performs uh, with the Lua. So we should have like methods in order to set uh, a given value inside the key in order to manipulate all the kind of types that uh, Redis has. So set manipulations, list manipulations, sorted set manipulations, bloom filters, uh, uh, not sorry, I mean hyperlog logs, everything that Redis is able to do should be basically part of the Lua bindings. That would be extremely complex because uh, sure, sure you cannot implement that in that space and there is also one problem. If we check uh, how Redis is implemented internally, uh, well, this command uh, that implements the set Redis command doesn't really call a higher level API uh, in order to do the work. Ye yes, sometimes there are things like set key, but as you can see here, the expire is uh, handled directly by the command, also the notification of events. Uh, it's very important for Redis to be like, uh, to call only a very low level API and then have an abstract API that commands implementation call in order to be more efficient. For example, if I check the ink command, Uh, here we do tricks in order to save uh, time. Like if the object reference counting is just one, so the object I have, I'm incrementing as just one owner, 
and the and the encoding uh -huh. of the object is integer so it's uh, encoded already as a number I just increment the number so what I do is like uh, I just cast the new value inside the pointer to represent the integer uh, as a pointer uh, as a long value inside uh, the object so this is just a low level implementation trick you cannot do that if you if you start to have layers of abstraction your code looks better you have probably less bugs but you are missing a lot of opportunities for optimization it's terrible for me that Redis memory efficiency and, and uh, um, CPU efficiency forces me to uh, write code in a way that is less abstract compared to what I, I wish it was but uh, in system software this kind of uh, compromises are often to be made so uh, basically we don't have like a, a redis db increment a, a increment key api api so in order to implement scripting like that with bindings uh, there was the need to create this huge API to start and then implement scripts in this term that would be a huge project uh, so instead there was to find a simpler way to implement scripting and uh, this is what, what basically we do uh, the idea is that Redis Lua scripting can pretend to be just a normal Redis client, like a networked client, however, without the socket uh, between uh, the client and the server, but we can hook just in the moment the command is dispatched uh, and then we receive uh, the reply of the command in the buffer, in the client buffer that's ready to be, to be basically sent to the network, but instead of doing the, this, we convert that value into a Lua type. So let's see uh, this conceptually and then uh, in terms of code. So we said basically normal clients just uh, send a query, the query is parsed and we have client argv and client argc that describe the command to execute then we dispatch this command that is executed and as a result we have uh, uh, the client output, bu output buffers uh, with the protocol that's ready to be sent like I don't know I can have like an array of items uh, and so forth this is not actually this protocol almost but just to understand what's happening like I can replay with uh, an array or something like that so why we can instead we create a Lua fake client that's the same structure as the C client is in a way the same uh, this structure oh, however the file descriptor is set to minus one to say this client is not not actually connected then when lua executes something like redis.call set foo bar what we do here is to just populate the client that v with set and so forth the, the arguments and arc c will be set to 3 ok at this point we call the call function uh, that we saw in the previous episode of writing system software that will just uh, basically take this client and will execute uh, the, the command that is in the argument vector and will uh, uh, as a result the c uh, client output buffers will be set to the protocol to reply. Uh, 
At this point, we call a function that's like Lua convert Redis protocol to Lua type. See, with the fake client, Lua fake client. Basically, in this way, the, the Redis.call interface is able to call any, any command that the, the, the client could call. Uh, however, we turned our normal client-server interaction inside an API that we can use between, uh, between the Lua scripting uh, and the C code inside Redis. Let's check the actual implementation. So uh, uh, we use basically a single Lua interpreter for all the clients because we can do that because Redis is mostly single threaded. Uh, at least the, the execution of the Lua scripts on, always happen in the main thread. So what we can do basically is to reuse the same Lua uh, interpreter and if there is a script already uh, defined, we will reuse it every time. There is no need to compile again the script. That's one of the reasons why Redis Lua scripting is so fast, almost as fast as uh, C coded commands. Uh, so we skip basically the creating an interpreter every time. We skip the compiling the script again. We compile the script just the first time we see uh, a new script. So well, one thing that we need is a function in order to turn uh, a script inside into the SHA-1 representation. This is trivial. And okay, this is the core Redis reply to what I conversion function. The Redis, uh, um, the Redis protocol, while protocol is very simple, it's called RESP. And uh, here we wrote quite clear, uh, very simple in, um, parcel for this protocol that's based on then analyzing the first character and then calling other functions. It's an integer, it's a string, it's a status, or it's an array, and so forth. And let's check, for example, the Redis protocol to Lua type uh, integer conversion. Uh, this protocol uh, is like colon, number, uh, CRLF, so what we do is to look for uh, the CR character and uh, we convert basically everything uh, uh, else uh, but the colon, so there is plus one here uh, to, from string to number and then we push that number uh, inside the Lua stack and that's it and okay, this is a string, it's similar uh, this is uh, um, the status reply, it's also a symbol string, the error. The more complex is the bulk because it's recursive. The multi bulk uh, protocol is basically just a, a, an array, and the array can have uh, other arrays so on any other type embedded inside the, the elements. So basically, we j just here iterate and call again Redis protocol to Lua type. Uh, recursively and that's it um, uh, let's check uh, uh, other interesting types oh of course we have also the contrary we want to turn uh, Lua uh, replies to Redis replies but this is even simpler because you just the string we have already the reply functions that command implementations use inside Redis so if it's a Lua number, we just call alt reply long long. If it's a string, we call alt reply C buffer and uh, so forth. Uh, now I want to show you the implementation of Redis.call. Uh, you know, the, the, the glue, Redis.call, I'll push my list. This it is. Lua command that performs the binding is basically in that function here. 
Okay, so the client is our Lua client, and this in the global server variable because it's shared, it's created and the scripting engine initialization and it's used forever. Uh, we cache objects in order to avoid the allocation because in this kind of things you will see that malloc and free will burn a lot of cycles so you want to do some smart caching. Uh, also if people are able like in some funny way to call the scripting engine within the scripting engine we understand that and draw an error instead of crashing normally this is not possible because the eval command itself is not allowed to run inside the scripting but you can use uh, other uh, strange Lua debugging things in order to perform that uh, okay, so what we do basically is for every argument we uh, populate uh, the client argument vector, this is our argv, uh, here is the, the caching thing, and uh, when we basically populate, uh, populated our argument vector, we set the argument vector in the client structure, and uh, the number of arguments here. Uh, this is some code for the debugger. Then we look up the command uh, from the Redis command table and well if the, the command is, doesn't exist of the number of arguments is wrong you just reply with an error. Otherwise oh it could be also a command that's not allowed uh, for scripts or we can detect that there is a side effect a non-deterministic command is called uh, but finally what we do is uh, do to uh, call uh, no, here is Redis cluster redirection handling so basically in all, every complex function you will see all the other subsystems of Redis like playing a role Replication, AUF, cluster, well, this is uh, impossible to avoid. But eventually we will, we will be able to, to dispatch our command. So we make the call with our flex, depending if we want to propagate to AUF, replication, whatever. And finally, we can call our Redis protocol to Lua type function. So the, uh, Red, the Redis core is completely unaware that it's executing uh, in the context of, of a Lua script. From the point of view of the Redis core, it's just a network client trying to execute something. At this point, we uh, grab the output buffers and we convert back to a Lua type and uh, once we, de we, we do that, we already have basically the uh, Lua reply accumulated in the Lua stack. And basically, that's, that's it. Um, okay. And another thing that's interesting is that we want basically to understand if uh, um, a Lua script enters an infinite loop. That's simple to simulate. Okay, we have a server already. Um, okay, I have to remember how to write an infinite loop using Lua. Okay, we entered an infinite loop here. Uh, and Redis was able basically to, to detect this condition. Lua uh, slow script detected. Probably this was like slow Lua script detected back, but a few years ago it was even less English capable than today. So still in execution after, okay, you can configure this limit, but in general after five seconds, it looks like something is not working as expected. Not only Redis detected this condition, but the interesting thing is that if we try to conduct Redis 
it's even able to, to reply to us because what we do basically is to re-handle the event loop uh, from within Lua in order to perform still some computation even if actually being ready single threaded we are actually blocked inside the, the Lua interpreter looping forever. Let's check how this is implemented. Oh, and we can also use script kill in order to stop the execution of the script. Okay. And uh, yeah, the command got an error. Uh, script killed by user with script kill. Let's check the implementation of that. Mm, slow. Let's grab for slow. Yes. Okay. Lua mask count hook. Let's see how this works. Basically, before we are going to actually execute um, our Lua script, we set a Lua hook that should uh, basically be executed uh, every number, of, every given number of Lua interpreter execution ticks. So from time to time, this hook will be called and it's just a callback in C and I get the Lua state and I get also the Lua debugging state. So this is what happens. I compute the elapsed time between now and the moment that I, I started the Lua script. I, I set here in the global variable Lua time start. If too, too many time passed, too much time passed, uh, I emit the warning, I, uh, I delete the, uh, the readable event, uh, let's see why I do that, once the script timeouts we re-render the event loop, for the reason we need to mask the client execution, no, we do not do that the client event is connected, could no longer be here when the eval, okay, we don't want basically this uh, the client that executed the script, we don't want it to be destroyed, otherwise when we re-enter the event loop everything will crash. Uh, however, because now if we are timed out, we want to process, we want to re-enter the event loop and in Redis we have a function in order to do that, it's called process events while blocked. And finally, if the script is uh, killable, we also say that the script is killable. The script is only killable if it did, did not already wrote something to Redis, otherwise it's no longer killable. This is because uh, Lua scripts have a contract with the user, they are executed all or nothing. So if you have an infinite loop with a script that already wrote something, uh, in the data set, the only option is basically to kill the, the server entirely. There is no other way because we have to respect this contract with the user. Okay, that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and see you the next time. Bye.